First thing I have to do is apologize for not putting this up sooner. It's just that last week was a very hectic week. I want to talk about the effects of the machine age on American business, government, society, and, and the people in particular. And the consequences of industrialization, the inventors, manufacturers, harness technology, to increase production work, factory workers divided work routines into repetitive tasks, which although allowed them to maximize profit, took so much away from the workers as human beings, created a new consumer society, and then corporations became extremely powerful as they grew and grew in power and, and growth for profits. Industrialization created a consumer society in that uh, people could no longer had to make everything one thing at a time or like if you wanted some horseshoe you had to go to the horseshoe one guy in town who made the horseshoes homemade handmade was no longer needed or possible because of the invention of how to use electricity and steel production with the growth of consumer products and by industrialization and mechanization, people began to crave, to need, feel a need for material products. And the United States became the factory of the world. And naturally, Americans led the world in consumerism. Driven by the freedom to invent without much government interference, because governments didn't feel that they should invent uh, or interfere in inventions and and in manufacturing, and also with very strong, eventually very strong patent protection. American inventors like Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, Ford, and anybody else who invented any ideas and, and patented them, they were protected. Between 1960, uh, 1860 and 1930, the US Patent Office gave 1.5 million patents Edison alone, I've been to the Edison's home in New Jersey, over 1,000 inventions. Henry Ford adapted other people's inventions to create the Ford Motor Company. With industrialization, you, have create, you begin to create the modern world. Atlantic Cable laid from, from the United States to England and into Europe connects the world with instant communications. Ancillary businesses, that means that to make a car, you need a company, you need to produce steel, you need to produce wood, because in those days the body of the car might be made out of wood. You need paint, you need rubber, you need oil, glass, cloth. You didn't have plastic that early. All of these things created other industries that fed into the main industry, was called horizontal and vertical integration would be like if the company that makes the cars begins to buy up the other companies that produce the paint, the rubber, the oil, and so on. The Ford Motor Company, you have to go to YouTube and find uh, videos about Henry Ford and how his idea of the assembly line exploded the production of cars. When you explode the production of cars, then you explode the number of, of uh, consumers who want the cars, particularly because like the Model T was very inexpensive. And the more cars you produce, then you produce also great demand for uh, better roads in, in the cities and then be roads between cities. And then you also produce an effect of people now can buy a car and they don't have to live in the city so they can live outside the city. So a couple decades later, by the 40s, and then certainly by the 50s, you've got mass uh, migration away from the cities to the suburbs. Companies like DuPont create things, uh, fertilizers, dyes, cellulose, eventually something wonderful called plastic. You look around today and you can see that uh, without plastic, we would. I'm just looking around my uh, home office here, and almost everything is plastic, except the wooden bookcases, and the metal little refrigerator, and books. Everything else is like plastic. 
By the 1920s and 30s, great improvements on synthetics. So by the Second World War, you've got German companies making uh, artificial rubber, uh, artificial oil, uh, pioneered methods of management. That, that's very significant because before the 1920s, you really didn't have anything called scientific management. And if you, scientific management refers to uh, people like Winslow Taylor who came up with ideas of how if you sat and you studied, work studied, um, studied the, the labor that people do, you can come up with better ways of doing it. Accounting, double entry bookkeeping becomes universal. And, oh, back to the plastic. Plastic is made from petroleum and, and another wonderful, uh, it's a little bit long, but if you're very interested in the petroleum business, the history of petroleum, there's a YouTube video, it's called The Prize, strongly recommended if you want to write your research paper about petroleum, but make it about a specific period. The southern United States, it's, it's still in, in this period up until the 1920s is, is still agriculture. There's uh, little small businesses, small industries. Eventually it begins to grow with technology uh, into textiles and some steel manufacturing. I remember, uh, yeah, it's at the bottom, Birmingham, Alabama, steel and iron manufacturing. But people begin to move their factories to the south because of the less expensive labor. Mechanization and status of labor. The workers began to be very dissatisfied with factory labor, but they had no choice. You will see in American history a rise of labor unions uh, in the 1910s. In the 1920s, after the First World War, it begins to decline, but be mostly because of something called the Red Scare, where people were very opposed to the Bolshevik Revolution in, in Russia, the creation of the Soviet Union and communism declaring it was going to take over the world and capitalists naturally afraid of communism and that kind of thing. Uh, mechanization and the status of labor, the workers were slaves. You work on an assembly line day after day, you're a slave to the machine, the clock, the foreman. When possible, but the labor laws that were passed in the 1910s and 20s made it less possible. The men replaced by women and children in many industries because they worked for lower wages, but that didn't last long in this period. The status of labor. Women stayed in their place. There were women's jobs and men's jobs, and this didn't really change until the 1960s. Uh, night and even the 1970s. Wim <laughs> clerical and retail jobs went to women. There were women uh, typists, bookkeepers, sales clerks. Uh, women were actually called typewriters. Sex discrimination was pervasive. Men would not give up their jobs. Uh, men, men were still teachers uh, until 1930s, 1940s, actually the 1940s more because of the war and men went off to join the military and women had to move into a lot of men's, what was considered men's work. And so we'll talk about this later, but after the war was over, the women who had moved into men's positions in manufacturing and just about everything, they were reluctant to give up their positions and just about everything. There were few laws to protect the workers. There's the incident of the Triangle fire, Shirtwaist Fire in 1911 where 146 women died because they had to jump out of fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh story building. Uh, the doors were locked. The companies did not obey uh, the fire laws and labor laws of working conditions. Uh, that's changed in the United States. Very, very strict working laws but if you might have read in the news just a, a month or two ago, a building in Bangladesh collapsed, a building that makes our polo shirts or uh, whatever collapsed and killed several, many, many, many people, workers, all women. 
because the building was badly built, there were no, con no construction rules. So in some parts of the world, things haven't changed much at all. Standards of living refers to many things. Number one, in the cities. In the cities, we'll talk about that next semester, next semester, next, next uh, week, this coming week. But in the cities, the, the, the sanitation was, was not good. Things began to change. People began to demand better things for themselves. People out in the country, the farmers far away, because of the railroads and uh, postal services, they could buy things in, in through catalogs. Companies like uh, Montgomery Ward and Sears and Roebuck created catalogs with just about everything you can imagine. And Americans were their best fed, better clothed, and better housed than ever before. People felt like the country was moving along, moving along very quickly, and moving in the right direction. The consumer culture defined not only the place of residence, but people become defined by what they own, possessions. Uh, if you look at it today, um, someone who owns an iPhone certainly must be a better person than someone who has a Blackberry, and someone like me who doesn't want either one of those things <laughs> is definitely lower on the scale or the, s the status symbols. I I have other things that make up for it. I have a MacBook Pro. It accentuates the differences between those who can afford goods, the haves and the have-nots. And money and possessions that give people social status. And that was not created in the 18 and late 1800s or early 1900s. But that's been true for thousands of years. But now it, it, it's the physical possessions, things that you can buy. You show people what you can buy. Like when you get to the 1950s, um, people, my television is bigger than your television, that kind of thing. And there's a growing middle class. And the growing middle class creates what we call rising expectations. More standardization creates more everyone trying to be at least the same as everybody else and maybe owning something a little bit better. More is better. Factories, factory made everything, and people had access to it. Not everybody, but most people, more and more people. More and more people had better access to fresh fruit, fruit meats, vegetables, therefore people had better health. The tin can, I always thought this was kind of an interesting thing because when I was a kid living on a farm, that when my father retired from the army, bought a farm, and every year in our August and September, we would g uh, gather our crops. We had a big garden. We all worked in the garden, and the, pro the, the produce from the garden, my mother would go through a process called canning. We didn't put it in cans. We put it in sealed glass jars. Then you boil the sealed glass jars in a pressure cooker, and the food stays edible for <laughs> sometimes years. We found bottles of ketchup that were in the basement 20 years later, and it, it was fine. It was, it was sealed, and it was fine. They invented something called the tin can. When you do that, and then you process the food, and you put it in the can, and you seal it, you've, you've all opened a can of something. You can preserve the food longer. Something called the refrigerator was invented. I remember as a child that my grandmother living up in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, had something called an ice box. A man would come around every day in a wagon, and he'd have big blocks of ice uh, with, uh, surrounded by uh, wood shavings. Uh, and then he, he would take the block of ice and carry it in and put it in the under this metal box, the size of a refrigerator, and the food would be kept cool in there because until the ice melted, and then tomorrow he would come back with another block of ice, which I don't remember what it cost, but it couldn't be more than two or three cents in those days. Then you had big companies inventing things like cornflakes, uh, grape nuts, and it changed Americans' breakfast habits, and inventing other things. And then something that uh, I found, have always found very interesting, was a sewing machine. They made smaller sewing machines that were affordable by people, and they could, people could make things of their own in the house. 
and even when I was a kid in, in I don't know, 10th, 11th grade, early 1960s, many of us took uh, courses in high school called home economics, and we learned how to operate sewing machines, and I still know how to operate one, though I haven't done it in many years, but I know how to do it. Mass-produced clothing creates fashion demand. Fashion, the, the people that, m that do in this business, they make, pe not so much for men. If you look at men's clothing from <laughs> 100 years ago, men still wear a suit with a tie and a shirt, and the only thing that really changes is the cut of the lapels or the cut of the pockets or the cut of the suit. Women fashions is totally different. Women's fashions is a, one of the major world industries and it's all planned a year or two in advance of what women will be told is the thing to buy and all the women run out and buy it. Department stores uh, feed consumerism. The, the people, then you have more access to more things. It mentions uh, Macy's you may have been to a Macy's, Marshall Field, is, is Marshall's, uh, what's the other one, TJ Maxx, Ross. Um, those were the beginning, all of this stuff was the beginnings of like Walmart, Kmart, five and ten stores. I remember Woolworths and Grants many years ago. They all, when, when, when companies like Walmart and Kmart come along with greater economy of scale, and the ability to set up, you, you should learn more. If you're going to go into the business of any business, even the hotel business, you need to learn about Walmart and what made it success, what makes it successful. And one of it is, it's it's um, what's it called? The supply chain. Same thing with large grocery grocery chains. I go to South Florida a lot. And my favorite store is Public Supermarket, or one of my favorite stores, besides Best Buy, where I buy my toys. Manufacturers had to create demand, so the art of marketing and advertising, which is on us, our internet is full of marketing. Every time we turn around, somebody's trying to sell us something. If you go from in Guayaquil to the beach, the billboards, magazine advertising, fancy storefronts, flyers, and now your television's covered with marketing and marketing and trying to convince you that you need, you must have, the best thing you can buy, uh, must see TV, everything is a must. You must have these things. You must have a new iPhone. iPhone 5's coming out, so iPhone 4 is no longer any good. That started back then, too. Corporate consolidation takes a lot of money. Big companies cooperated with each other. You got to remember about antitrust laws. They couldn't cooperate too much. They, they were more watched. But to sell more, the more they produced, the more they had to expand their markets. So now they got overproduction. So how do you, you sell your overproduction? Is you've got to create consumer demand. To do that, you do it through advertising and marketing, and you spend lots of money on advertising and marketing. Uh, Corporations in the 1800s, pools and trusts. You should read this carefully because it, it was collusion between the companies and how they did things. And Rockefeller created the trust. One company control an industry by luring or forcing stockholders. If you're interested in, in a really interesting research would be uh, Rockefeller, the Rockefeller company and how he became the major, what do you call it in Spanish, magnate, one of the richest people in the world. And finally, social Darwinism. Social Darwin is in a free market economy. How could you justify these things? Well, they say that th the fittest survive, and the ones who are not fit, they fail. That, that's capitalist social Darwinism. The gospel of wealth, the guard, Andrew Carnegie said that uh, okay, we became wealthy, but our duty is to serve society, and he did. He gave almost all of his money away, but others didn't. Uh, social Darwinism, Darwinism was hypocrisy. In the mass scale, as all the paternalistic forms of controlling people are hypocrisy.